appreciate that and can't put in words uh, how much I appreciate that. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Uh, it will be part of what we text will cover last Sunday plus uh, what we go into today. But it all goes together, so we'll read it together as a text. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for this morning and for this chance to be in your house for everybody that's here uh, in this congregation today, Lord. So thankful for your love for us, for your protection over us, for, for just how good you are. And I just pray that uh, even right now in these next few moments as we get into your word, uh, that, Lord, that's what we will remember and, and, and put our minds on is just how good you are to us and, and what you expect out of us. So help us, Lord, today to get from your word what you sent it to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I, read, I went ahead and read the whole section together. We, we did cover the, the first part of that from verse uh, 25 to 29 uh, last Sunday where the scribe, the lawyer, the scribe stands up and and ask Jesus what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus asks him, well, what does the law say? Because he's an expert in the law. And, and, and how we just now, if you remember we talked about last week, what do you recite twice a day? And he came back with the correct answer twice a day. He recited what you could take all the commandments of the law and put into two. Uh, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you say, that's right. Now go and do it. We talked about last week, we know he couldn't go and do it. That was the problem. If we could go and do it, we could be saved and get eternal life too, but we can't do it either because we're fallen, human, sinful people. And we ended with that, that verse uh, 29, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That, that was his problem. He didn't want to hear about mercy and grace from a Savior or something that he needed to be saved. He didn't want to hear that he had fallen behind and not done what he was supposed to do. He didn't want to be classified, like Romans said, of having fallen short of the glory of God. So he was willing to justify himself. Well, what does that mean he was willing to justify himself? Well, he went straight to, well, who was my neighbor? In other words, I've already loved God perfectly, or at least that's what he thought in his own mind. I do. I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. Got that covered. I love my neighbor. Got that covered. Now, unless, Jesus, you, you have changed the definition of neighbor. So just, just who all is supposed to be my neighbor? Again, you can see the 
arrogance that he has in that he's done all those things. So surely he's going to get eternal life. And again, remember we talked about last week, he thought he'd get eternal life anyway because he was a Jew and all Jews get eternal life. All Jews go in heaven because that's God's people. They don't have to do anything just the fact that they're Jews. And so he poses that little question there to Jesus. Who is my neighbor? So Jesus answers him again. First he answered him and told him, yeah, you can get it right now. Now go and do that. No one he couldn't do it. So now he's going to give him an answer about who is my neighbor. And we get into this story that's so familiar to us. So familiar, in fact, that uh, your Bible may say at the beginning of this section, the Good Samaritan. Uh, whether people know the Bible or not or know the, the back story to it, they've all heard Good Samaritan. Know what a Good Samaritan is. A Good Samaritan is somebody that helps somebody that's in need. All that comes from this little passage of Scripture. So we understand it. We've got it. Matter of fact, in the state of Alabama, on our laws, there's Good Samaritan law. You, you're supposed to stop and help somebody that's in need. Well, that is the backstory to this text. It, it is about how we ought to love our neighbor and help someone who's in need. But in reality, when you get down to it, it's really an evangelical message. Jesus is going to give this story to this man. This unbelieving, self-righteous man to confront him about his self-righteousness and hope to bring about uh, an acknowledgement that he's a sinful man and he needs mercy and grace. That's really the purpose in the story that Jesus is going to give. And, and I'll say that too. This is a story. This is a parable. This is something that's made up. This is not a, a real man. This is not real thieves. This is not a real innkeeper. So people get to argue. And, 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 and believe me, this is such a popular story. There's lots of arguments among scholars and symbolism and what this means and what this means. And this is what the oil and wine is. And this is what the blood is. And this is what the inn is. And this is what the, the donkey is. And It's a story, folks. Jesus made it up in this instance to show this man where he stood. And so keep that in mind as we go through it. So we just pick up with, with verse 30 where, where we'll start, where we left off last Sunday. Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's a popular, known trek, travel for these people in this day. The road that goes, and it is down. Remember, Jerusalem's up. It's up on a hill, up on a mountain, up. So to go down to the valley into Jericho, to go that direction, was a dangerous travel. Uh, according to the statistics, you can go and take that road now. 17 miles, and it drops 4,000 feet during those 17 miles. And it's some cliff places and some precipices and some places where if you fall off, you drop down two, three hundred yards before you hit something next. It's a really dangerous and foreboding road to travel just because of that. But also in this time, because of that and because of places to hide and because of, once they got, got you right there, there's nowhere for you to go. It was a place for robbers. It was a place for folks with ill-gotten means. It was a place for people to come, take you, take your stuff, and leave you high and dry. And so not only was it dangerous for the geography part of it, it was dangerous because of the, the thieves and the pirates that hung out around there and tried to take your stuff from you. So they understood. Matter of fact, the Old Testament, this same uh, road was called the Pass of Adjumen, or if you translate it into our language, the Bloody Pass. So that's how it got its name from that. It's a dangerous place. So when he gives this description, this lawyer, this scribe knows exactly what he's talking about. And then all the people standing around listening know exactly what he's talking about. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and did exactly what's predictable. Fell among the thieves. And this is what they did to him. Stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, left him half dead. We can understand that. We can see that picture in our mind. Took all his clothes off of him, took his stuff from him, every possession he had, beat him to a pulp, left him, as Jesus used the word here, half dead, and just left him laying there. So we can see that. 
Unfortunately, in our society, we see that happen now. Except sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's by the grace of God that they leave you half dead instead of all dead. But they left him half dead. He's in need. He needs immediate assistance. He is in the process of dying. And he's left there to fend for himself all by himself. But verse 31 says, by chance. This is good. If you're listening to Jesus tell the story and you've not read this story before, you had not heard it, you don't know what's fixed to happen next, you think this is good. By chance. Well, that's a good chance. This fellow's lucky. He's lucky he didn't die all the way. He's just half dead. And here comes a priest going to say it. By chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, here comes a priest, a servant of God, spiritually virtuous, somebody who would definitely help anybody that's in need. I mean, the law states in Leviticus that even a stranger, if you find a stranger in need, in danger, in harm, hurt, you are to help them. A stranger. Doesn't say nothing about it having to be a Jew. do not say a stranger. So here comes the priest. Here comes the preacher. You say, well, it's about time we get on preachers today instead of getting on all us, right? Here comes the preacher. Surely he's going to help out. Surely he's going to do everything he can to help. But notice what Jesus says. Jesus said he sees him. He goes by on the other side. A lot of translations put it this way. He went the opposite direction. Now, again, we've talked about this before. This ain't you in Walmart and you see somebody that you don't want to talk to, so you go the other way. <laughs> in reality, that ain't real harmful. Probably ain't right, but it ain't real harmful. This is somebody dying. This is somebody beat to a pole. This is somebody in desperate need. And a man of God. A servant of God and a servant to the people purposefully walks to the other side goes around. Now again, you get all kinds of arguments and things. Some people say, oh, well, he was afraid he's going to get robbed. Some people say, well, he couldn't go there because that man was bleeding and he's unclean and the priest can't touch something that's unclean. Some folks argue and say, well, he didn't go there because he thought that man was being punished by God. Well, let me tell you something. It's not a real man and it didn't really happen. Jesus is telling the story. So none of that stuff counts. The purpose of the story and the idea is here's somebody that ought to have compassion and ought to help the highest of the high in the religious elite and he goes by on the other side and ignores the dying man. That's the gist of it. So that's what we have to get out of it this morning. He could have had compassion, and he didn't. The next one is, verse 32, likewise, same thing, same story. Here comes a Levite. Levite, the tribe the priests come from. So again, not just any old child of God, not just any old Jew, not just any old child of Israel, I should have said, but a Levite. They know. They know the law. They've been brought up in the priestly realm. They understand it. They know they're supposed to help. But here comes the Levite. And when he was at that place, came and looked on him, passed on the other side. Second chance. Jew, good Jew, good Jew. All you got to do is stop and help. Goes by on the other side. Well, that's bad enough. So here's this log of this scribe. Jesus is telling this story. We've had a priest come by, had a Levite come by, nobody's helped. Who's going to help? Number three, we know it already. This lawyer described it at the time. But boy, Jesus really gets him. And, and you'll understand, you'll remember if you don't already remember right off the top of your head. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Stop there for a second. We're going to do not just any old other person, but we're going to go the opposite of the priest and the Levite. Now we're going to find a Samaritan. Again, this is where we get the word, the term we use for somebody to help somebody, but this is a real person. This is a Samaritan. Somebody from Samaria. You a Shannonite. You came from Shannon. <laughs> this is a Samaritan. 
<laughs> now, we have to remember there is animosity between these two groups of people. Jews don't like Samaritans. They used to hundreds and hundreds of years ago be together. But a certain group of Jews went out and intermarried among the Gentiles in the surrounding lands. And when they did, they became unclean. And the Jews pushed them away and would have nothing to do with them. Fast forward in time. There's this angst between them. But when the Jews go back to rebuild the temple and rebuild the wall, the Samaritans offer to help them, which was good. They needed help. The Jews said, we don't want your help. You stay away from us. We don't like you. We've never liked you. We don't want no part of you. You're not going to touch our wall. You're not going to touch our temple. So the Samaritans decided they'd build their own temple. The Jews worshipped Jehovah God in Jerusalem at the temple, and they built them a temple up in the mountains where they could worship God. The animosity is so bad that about 130 years or so before Jesus is born, some Jews, some Israelites, go up in the mountain and destroy that temple of Samaritans. They hated them so bad. When you get to Jesus' time, and you'll remember this, Jews would not even go through Samaria, even though that was an easier route to go certain places. But they would add an extra day's journey and go around Samaria to keep from having to go through it because they didn't want Samarian dust on their feet. If you remember, that's why when Jesus meets the woman at the well, it's in Samaria. That's a Samaritan woman. And the first thing she asks is, why are you even talking to me? knowing who I am. And you remember in the conversation, she says, you say, serve God in Jerusalem. My father say, serve him in the mountains. So who's really right? So that's the back story of that. So here's somebody that this lawyer, scribe, would hate, despise a Samaritan. He would have loved the priest. He would have loved the Levi. They didn't even give a second look to this man. But here comes a Samaritan, somebody that he hates, somebody that he despises, somebody that he likes nothing of. And the Samaritan comes, and I love the way Jesus puts it at the end of verse 33. He has compassion on him. A little rub a little salt in the wound. In other words, your priest had no compassion. Your Levite had no compassion. The Samaritan that you think is filthy, dirty, and you don't want nothing to do with had compassion. And there's the difference. Two men, no love for the stranger. One man, love for the stranger. Two men who had religion, no love for the stranger. One man who had the wrong religion had love for the stranger. Jesus goes into detail of it. I like this. Again, remember, this is made up, but I like the detail. He went to him. Other two went around him. So I like the way Jesus put it. He went to him. Bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. No, he wasn't trying to get him drunk. Remember, wine was used as an antiseptic. It would kill germs, just like alcohol does today. So that was, that was medicinal for people at that time. He must have had some really bad cuts, scrapes, maybe broken bones, maybe a bone sticking out. Who knows? We don't know. He didn't go into great detail about that. But he had to use oil and wine because that was the only medicine they had back then. Maybe it's what mommy used to put on me, Mercure Farm. Remember that stuff? Remember that purple stuff or orange stuff? Maybe it was that. Something like that. I won't tell why she had to put it on me because y'all already know that story. <laughs> Puts this medicine on him. Takes care of him because he's got compassion on him. Sets him on his own beast. The man can't walk. He's beat half to death. Puts him up on his beast. Jesus says beast. You get people argue what the beast is. It don't matter. He can't make the story. It's a beast. Mule. Don't get some. Puts him up on the beast. <coughs> brings him to an end. And took care of him. Now, first thing you think, Ian, that's good. 
inn. We've been talking about inn at Christmas time. The inn. There's no room in the inn. All right, let's let's talk about what inns were real quick. And make sure you understand. Uh, this what what was that place we stayed at for the men's conference hour? Scott, I had to answer it last time. That's right. Well, it was super nice. It was probably the nicest hotel I ever stayed in. It wasn't, that ain't the inn it was. It wasn't no, no uh, uh, Marriott or whatever that thing was. This is more like, and like you say, this is about to say it wrong. This is more like the Motel 6 on the wrong side of town. This ain't the right <laughs> place. This is the no-tail motel, roach motel. This is rough stuff. That's the way inns were then. So when Jesus didn't have room in the inn, it really wasn't that bad of a thing for him not to have room in the inn. Those ends were like those bad places today. Full of criminals, full of crooks, full of prostitutes, full of people that would swindle you out of everything. It wasn't really good places to be and stay. But for somebody that's half dead, it was a welcome place. Because it got him off the side of the road. And this Samaritan took him in and began to help him. By the story, he stays with him all night long. And takes care of him. It says that in the verse 34, took care of him in 35 on the morrow. So he took care of him all night long. Bound up his wounds, continued to clean him up, got him a place to stay. Then he goes to the innkeeper. Again, in a place like this, the inn innkeeper is usually pretty corrupt himself, pretty much a crook. And he gives him money. Money. It says the Bible says two pence. Some translations say two denarii. It said here. Take care of him for me while I'm gone. Now, you, again, you go back, you can find all kinds of answers on this. I found everything from one thirty-second of a denarii uh, or of this amount of money to, to stay a night in the inn all the way up to one twelfth. So basically he gave him two denarii or two pence. So it was either anywhere from 24 days to 64 days worth of staying. Pretty good chunk of change. He said, here's the money. Take care of him. Let him stay. Long as he, because again, he's got to be pretty bad off. It ain't like he's gonna be up the next morning, get his free continental breakfast, and be on the road. <laughs> he's messed up. So he gives him all of this money to a, probably a crooked man, and says, "Take care of him." But that's not just it. He don't just leave either a month or two months' money for him to stay. He says, "Hey, and anything extra that you got to spend on him, just keep a tab. When I come back, I'll pay for." What a man. What compassion. What love for a complete stranger. And hey, you scribe, if I gave you three choices and told you which one I'm getting, you wouldn't have picked Samaritan. You'd have picked the priest. It wasn't the priest. It wasn't the Levite. It was the Samaritan. So he tells him all of that. And then verse 36, he says, Now which one of these three? Scribe, lawyer, expert, willing to justify yourself. Which one of these three was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Well, he didn't have but one answer. He knew what to say. Verse 37, he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Here's the problem. He couldn't go and do thou likewise. Because that wasn't the kind of person he was. And most people wouldn't go and do that likewise. Because that's not the kind of people they are. Remember what you take all of the commandments and boil them down to? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And what's it say about the neighbor? Love your neighbor as you do yourself. This fella did for that person on the side of the road beat half to death, exactly what he would have done for himself if he could have. Got him the best care, took care of him, did everything, took care of it all, paid for everything, did everything just like if he'd been his own self in that situation. <clears throat> this scribe, this lawyer, that's not what he was about. Now, is it a story for us to understand who our neighbor is and what we ought to do and what that concept of Loving our neighbor as ourselves is sure it is. But in the end, it really is Jesus showing this man what real mercy is. 
And the man understood it. Because we said, which one of them is the man? He said, well, it's the one who showed mercy. But we never see or hear if this man ever realized that he needed mercy. And he needed grace. Instead, the way it's worded, we feel like he just kept justifying himself. Again, do you know how many people are in hell right now who thought they were going to heaven? Do you know how many people in your family that you work with, that you come in contact with every day, think they're going to heaven because they think they live a good life? And they have no concept of needing mercy and needing grace. Again, I don't want to get into all the symbolism stuff because I don't think that's what the Lord meant, but I will say this. Every one of us was just like that old fella, beaten down on the side of the road, bleeding and half dead, when God, out of mercy and grace, scooped us up and saved our souls. We needed it. This fella here needed it. We got people in our family that need it. We got people in our church that need it. We got people at work that need it. We don't need to be the priest. We don't need to be the Levite. We need to be the Samaritan. Amen. 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 While we stand in these come with the verse of invitation. Open all of this morning. If you'd like to come, pray, we'd love to pray with you this morning. Altar open the doors of the church while we sing.
church folks, but then you brought with uh, a new MacArthur study Bible, the best one they make. And uh, I want to present that to you and tell you to love it, live it, and learn it, and tell you how proud we are of it. Amen. Amen. Tell everybody what you are. I said, tell everybody what you are now that you're all right now. Oh, right. Well, let's go in there. 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 Don't forget tonight, Brad be preaching for us, so uh, remember that. You pray for him. Um, pray for me while I try to uh, defend myself against Carol here in the next minute or two. So. I'm a pee. Uh, I am too, so I don't know. Amen. Let's dismiss. Brother Barry, would you dismiss?